He's nice. The meditation, meditation before the explosion of energy that will happen. <laughs> Are you guys falling asleep from the lunch or no? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, jet lag. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna wave at my AV guy. Jared, are we live? Give me a wave, AV land. Yes, maybe. Well, I'm gonna have faith. It's two o'clock. Hey, Huan Ying, welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, my name is Jennifer Turner. And on behalf of the China Environment Forum that I direct and the Kissinger Institute at the Wilson Center, I want to welcome you to an afternoon meeting in our nice, cool oasis here in the, in the Ronald Reagan building. Um, you're today, besides getting some lemonade and iced tea and having a cool place to hang your hat for a couple hours, um, you're going to be treated to stories and information on so a topic that I'm, I'm glad we're going to more people come in here to, interested in the transition, actually the uncertain transition away from coal that's happening both in the US and China. That transition looks very different, but there's also a lot of similarities. Now, I've been directing the China Environment Forum for 18 years. We do lots of meetings and exchanges, publications that focus on energy and environmental issues in China. And sometimes I joke that we should, I should call the project the China Coal Forum, because I swear every other month we're talking about coal. And Melanie has been here several times talking about coal. I mean, we've looked a lot over the years at the, the pollution problems from coal. Our big choke point project looks at the water footprint of the coal sector, co-benefits of controlling co, the coal, the climate benefits, the health benefits, and a lot, of course, over the years on US-China cooperation on cleaner coal, clean energy, climate. So we've, we've done it all, but then I realized we hadn't. Because actually today, we're having a meeting like we've never had before. It's kind of funny. It's like it takes me 18 years to realize what I missed. Um, coal comes out, is brought out of the ground by people. And as that sector changes, you know, we've always often talked about the grid and the policies and the markets for coal and energy. And now today, some of, some of our speakers are actually going to talk about the people and what happens when the two energy giants in the world were shifting our coal sectors, right? What does that mean for the people? And um, and it, yeah, it, it all kind of started. Well, first I talked to Melanie because Melanie Hart, she's a senior fellow and director of the China policy uh, of China policy at the Center for American Progress. She recently co-authored a report called "Everything You Think You Know About Coal in China Is Wrong." All right. So first of all, she's going to fill our brain with correct information about coal in China. But so when the report came out, I said, "Hey, let, let's do a meeting." And then by chance. Was it Lucy? I think Lucy, you emailed me and said, hey, we just have a report that came out about coal in China. I'm like, ooh, I'm seeing a pattern here. Um, and so then Lucy and somehow we found Lisa, and I'll introduce him in a second. But so this meeting came together quite spontaneously. It's all Melanie's fault. So if you don't like it, just blame Melanie, I guess. But so Melanie's going to start us off talking a little bit more broadly about how China's transforming their coal sector you know, towards the cleaner and the better, you know, they're pr improving efficiency, reducing emissions, and, but also reducing the country's dependence. So fewer and cleaner coal plants, right? And a little bit about how that compares with what's happening here in the U.S. So she's starting us off. Hongsha Duan and Lucy Kitson, they're from the International Institute of Sustainable Development. Now they're going to talk about the opportunities and the pitfalls of China's large coal transition. And they're going to focus on what's happening in Shanxi. And there have been, they actually, it's a unique project. I've never heard of it before, but you, they worked with the Chinese government looking at uh, programs about how they could transition the coal miners in Shanxi province. And that, and you know, looking also, but their study also is looking at lessons from other countries around the world. So we're going to hear about other countries besides China. We're going to learn about, I think, Australia and Wales. And it's, we're doing a world travel here today. Um, and then, um, and then the last speaker is Lisa Abbott, who's a community organizer with Kentuckians for the Commonwealth. Now, it's a statewide social justice organization, and she's going to close us out with a discussion talking about how her group is promoting 
energy diversification in the Appalachians that keeps communities strong. So again, it's a social justice organization, and coal is not the only thing they do. Okay, well, I'll make that clear. <laughs> um, but and and I th and I really think and this is. She's going to be the first of what will be other speakers that will be coming here over the next year. We're going to bring people in from Montana and West Virginia to also talk about the coal transition, both from the grassroots and the grass and the what do we call it? We say the grass tops and the whatevers, you know, the people on top. <laughs> um, so that's kind of our roadmap for today. And your job, as attentive audience members, is to think of really difficult questions because there's nothing that these women cannot answer. All right? Does that sound like a plan, ladies? All right, Melanie, why don't you come on up and I'll get your PowerPoint going. Maybe some initial applause for the speakers. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. My name is Melanie Hart. I direct the China program at the Center for American Progress. I work quite a lot on energy, climate, and environment issues in China. And one thing we've been focusing on for quite some time is the fact that when we are in China, talking to people at the front lines of China's energy industries, it's very clear that there's a tremendous amount of transformation happening. Here in DC, there's a tremendous amount of uh, confusion about what exactly is happening in China. You know, there are renewable energy people in DC can, can quote phenomenal statistics about what China's building on a clean energy front, but people tracking coal still have the old talking point that China's building a coal plant every week and therefore they're not progressive on climate change. We wanted to get at the heart of that dichotomy and try to get some facts by uh, doing two things. First, last fall, I took a group of American experts on Chinese energy policy to China. We went to coal plants. We went down on the plant floor, standing next to the boilers. We went 200 meters underground a coal mine in Inner Mongolia. We went to coal to gas plants. We got out of Beijing and went and talked to the people who are running the, mecha the mechanics of coal in China to try to understand how are the policies that we see coming out of Beijing actually hitting the provinces and how are things changing, not just from a PR or policy perspective, but from an actual operational perspective. So that was the first thing we did. Secondly, we got a hold of unit level data on Chinese coal plants and compared them to unit level data on US coal plants to better understand how is China's coal industry changing in comparison to what's happening here in the United States. So we really wanted to do our best to show an apples to apples comparison of coal in China versus coal in the United States. Because from an American perspective, we're not perfect. So we, we need to be aware of the, the, you know, not just what's happening in China, but how does that compare with what's happening in other nations? It's difficult to do an apples to apples comparison. The US and China have the same landmass. They have one, more, one billion more people than we do in that landmass. We have about 300 million. They have 1 billion 300 million. So they need to generate more electricity. They have more consumers than we do. They're also at a lower developmental stage. They also have different natural energy resources. We have cheap and abundant shale gas. China doesn't. That's a pretty big difference. But given those differences, we wanted to construct the best that we could from an apples to apples comparison. And the way that we did that was we took information on every coal-fired power unit in the US, every coal-fired power unit in China, and ranked them based on the efficiency of those units from highest efficiency to low efficiency. And we took the top 100 from each country so we could compare. If you look at the best of what the US and China have to offer, how did those stack up? Because that way we can at least find a comparable piece of both nations' coal-fired power uh, system. And also it turns out that the overall capacity of that top 100 is about the same, 80 gigawatts in the US and 82 in China. So it made it possible for us to see at least how, how the upper echelon of our two coal fleets stack up. It turns out that China's is pretty clean and ours is pretty not clean. So out of the top 100 most efficient coal plants in both nations, 90 of China's are ultra supercritical. We have one. 
China's fleet is much newer than ours. Out of their top 100, um, most of them, every single one of them was built after 2006. Some of ours were built in the 60s. The average age of the co U.S. coal-fired power units is 39 years old. So that means our units were built with the technology of the 60s and 70s and 80s, and China's building units with the technology of 2015, 2016. Uh, the older ones are 2006. Um, so that, that gives China an edge in terms of what they're able to install. And because they're using newer technology, China's top 100 coal-fired power plants are more efficient than the U.S. top 100, and they produce less carbon emissions for every unit of power consumed. So, um, and again, that's because China's constructing newer plants that use cleaner, newer technologies than we have installed here in the United States. Um, so we, we recognize that China's entire coal-fired power fleet it does not look exactly like the top 100 does. They have a lot of, they still have a lot of subcritical plants that they're working on transitioning out as they transition the fleet toward more advanced technology. So when you, pl when you plot every power plant that China has today, um, the 19% the, the, oh, the of their total coal-fired power production is ultra supercritical, 25% supercritical and 56% subcritical. But you can see over time, the orange line that peaked and then crashed down, those are subcritical coal plants. So there are not very many subcritical coal plants being built in China today. I think last year it was only 11% of China's new capacity additions were subcritical. And the ultra supercritical has edged out the, the other technology comparisons. Over 56% of the new capacity additions last year were ultra supercritical. So there is some still old and dirty stuff left in the fleet. They're working to phase that out, but what's being built to replace it is overwhelmingly cleaner than anything we have operating in the U.S. today. So one of the levers that Beijing is using to push this trend is they're tightening the regulatory standards for coal-fired power. It's interesting to note that China's conventional air pollution standards are edging in front of the U.S. conventional air pollution standards. So when you look at SOX, NOx, and particulates, China's standards are a bit lower than the United States, and in some cases lower than the European Union as well. To be sure, there are concerns and problems with making sure that every single coal-fired power plant implements these standards and meets them, and there are always difficulties on the margin with that issue, but it's a fantastic trend that they're at least beating us on what they're trying to achieve, and those great ultra-supercritical plants that are coming online are very proud of their ability to achieve and even beat these standards. And uh, some of the plants that we visited actually have big billboards out in front of the main gate that track their by the minute SOX, NOx, and particulate rating so that local citizens know that these plants are doing quite well. So um, the other lever that China's pulling to push the old and inefficient plants out of the fleet and encourage the building of new, more efficient plants is they're ratcheting up their efficiency requirements. So China doesn't currently have a standard for carbon dioxide emissions by power plants. What they're doing is they're going after the amount of coal that a power plant can consume per unit of power produced and forcing them to bring that down. And when you bring down the amount of coal that you consume per unit of power produced, you bring down the amount of carbon emissions consumed as well. By 2020, no new power plant can be built in China that consumes more than 300 grams of coal equivalent per kilowatt hour produced. Every existing plant will have to be retrofitted such that it consumes no more than 310 grams of coal equivalent per kilowatt hour produced. No American coal-fired power unit can meet that standard today. We went unit by unit by unit by unit. None of our plants can meet that standard. So if China's regulatory trends continue on their track, and if ours remain stable, uh, n not even questioning if they get worse, but if ours remain stable by 2020, every existing coal-fired power unit in the United States would be illegal to operate in China because our units would not be able to meet their improving efficiency standards, which also means that our units are going to be producing more carbon dioxide than theirs are. 
So, you know, one thing that's important to address <laughs> is the fact that um, there was a big coal-fired power unit construction bubble in China in 2015 and 2016. And that confused a lot of people about what exactly is happening in China. Um, so basically, the backstory on that was around 2012, 2013, um, throughout the provinces nationwide in China, it everyone saw the writing on the wall. Beijing was committed to phasing down the nation's dependence on coal. They'd be phasing out the dirty plants and shifting the nation toward less coal reliance, more reliance on clean energy. From a na national perspective, that's a very laudable objective. When that filters down into the provinces, what happened was every province decided, well, if there are only going to be so many coal plants left, we want them to all be in our province so that we are the ones making the money off of coal. A lot of provincial governors said, well, if we're going to be jettisoning old plants, let's build a bunch of new ones so that we have some left and we don't have to import coal from other provinces, or power from other provinces. At the same time, around 2013, 2014, coal prices bottomed out, dropped very low. But China still has an old quota system whereby coal-fired power plants sign purchasing quotas with utility operators to sell power at state-set rates. So investors saw that in, the cr in that existing price environment, they could buy coal for cheap on the market, generate it into power, and sell the power at higher rates to the utilities. And so even if they were able to operate their plant for just five years, they thought they could still make a profit, and they rushed to get their plant construction uh, uh, permit pro permits through the process before Beijing cut off that power. At the same time, another trend was happening, which was in an attempt to streamline administrative efficiency, Beijing de um, uh, delegated plant approval authority from Beijing out to the provinces. So all of those provincial governors who were committed, were, were racing to be the last coal-fired power province standing, suddenly had a big red stamp that they could use to red, to green light every project that came across their desk. So there was a huge uptick tick in both new construction and um, ap applications for permits for new construction. And Beijing, when they saw that, it's an almost hilarious uh, response of regulatory measures um, my colleague Blaine Johnson uh, was working to track every single regulatory response from Beijing, and she was laughing that it almost sounded that they are becoming increasingly angry in the language and severity of me measures that were taken in response. So first, there were some very clear warnings sent down to the provinces saying, you're, you will get in trouble if you're building coal plants that don't fit your energy plan, um, and that, ex that, that accelerated until this year they began forcing the closure of plants some which were already in operation, some which would had, had already broken ground. So our, there, were, there were projects that investors had already sunk money into. They had equipment out in the field building the plant. Plants were half constructed. Beijing came and said, nope, those, those are done with. So they started getting rid of some of that old capacity. So you know, in, in 2015, China added 51,000 megawatts of new capacity. By 2016, that had already dropped to 35,000 megawatts because investors were getting the signal. Despite that drop, China still has a, a vast oversupply of plants. China's coal consumption needs are dropping very rapidly as steel, aluminum, cement, those heavy, uh, he heavy energy consumption sectors are phased out of the economy. That's bringing down the need for coal-fired power faster than those provinces are shutting down the plants. So China actually currently has a, a big oversupply in coal-fired power. And the result of that is that right now, every single coal-fired power unit in China is running at 40 47% uh, of its capacity. Um, they have more than they need, and that is another reason why they're shutting down plants quite rapidly. So, you know, I encourage people to read the report that we put out in May. We do provide, which I think is important to, to track, a, um, a regulatory by regulatory overview of the regulations that Beijing has been putting out on coal-fired power in reaction to the provincial bubble that a lot of people in Washington interpreted as signs that China was actually sticking with coal and going back to coal. It was actually provinces run amok. 
and then you can see Beijing taking back the reins. So I encourage people to actually take a look at what Beijing was doing. And we've provided a detailed English overview of those regulations for people. And we also provide, we want to be very transparent with our analysis. We provide unit by unit detail on the coal-fired power units that we were looking at in China and the United States. We also have um, a detailed research note online that explains the assumptions that we made when we were making these calculations, uh, explains how we calculated between units to get comparable numbers for the U.S. and China, and also gives all of our sources and why we chose some sources over others. We welcome questions, happy to talk to people who are doing similar research. I think the more we can be transparent about the data we're using to make our um, analysis and assumptions and arguments about what China is doing, the better. And so happy to answer questions about that. And there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in making all that yes. work together. <laughs> so, all right. Woo. So you're getting the big picture. So that the coal consumption needs are dropping, all these back and forth play in China. So it's dropping. So what about all those people? Let me get your PowerPoint up. You can... Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Hong Chiu and I are delighted to be here to present our work on coal transitions. Um, we're from the International Institute for Sustainable Development. We're um, an organization based in Canada, um, headquartered in Winnipeg, um, uh, but have offices in New York and in Geneva in Switzerland as well. I'm based in Geneva. Hong Chiu is currently in Ottawa. Um, and yeah, let's get, let's get started. So I'm not going to talk about China. Um, so I'm not going to talk about China, and I'm not going to talk about the US. What I'm going to do is to give an inter the international context behind coal transitions. And I'm going to start right here. Um, this is where, about five miles away from where I grew up. It's a, a coal field in, in the middle of England. And when I was about six years old, the government announced that they were going to close down a whole series of mines across the country. And this led to an immense political fallout, and it led to economic and social impacts that are still being felt today in many of these former communities. And I guess it's partly my experience of this transition that's prompted me to ask, uh, how can we make these, these kind of transitions better? And this is a hugely important question, because at the moment, the world looks to be facing an inevitable transition away from coal. And if we to make if this transition as successful as possible, then we need to plan for it. We need to prepare for it. It's not just going to happen. And there's plenty of precedent to draw on here. Um, why is transition inevitable? Well, <coughs> we think there are three main factors behind it. And the first one is this, that by and large, we don't mine like this anymore. We mine like this with driverless trucks and um, automaton. And regardless of whether we carry on co mining coal, we're going to be facing a transition away, um, transition issues away and job losses simply because of automation and mechanization. And reason two for the inevitable transition away from coal, well, that's a falling price of alternatives. And in recent years, a big story has been around the falling price of, um, of renewables, and in particular, solar PV. So that now, in some countries, at certain instances, solar PV is actually cheaper than, cheaper than coal fire generation. Um, 19, between 2015 and 2017, the Indian government held a series of solar auctions for solar capacity. Um, the prices revealed in these auctions were in the region of four US cents per kilowatt hour, which compares to a price for coal generation, which is more in the region of five cents per kilowatt hour in India. And where does this lead? Well, first of all, in May 2017, the Indian government cancelled 14 gigawatts of, um, of um, cancelled 14 gigawatts of planned construction. And in June 17, Coal India, which is the world's largest producer of coal, announced it was going to close um, 37, of 37 of its mines because they were no longer economically viable.
And reason three for the transition away from coal is this, it's pollution. And not just the GHG emissions here, which are obviously um, very important, but more around the um, impacts that are associated with um, particulate matter and the effects that these have on human health. And these effects are becoming an increasingly important part of the debate on the, on the energy mix. Um, in 2014, Ontario closed its last coal-fired power station in a program that lasted seven years, um, which was primarily motivated by the desire to limit these impacts on human health from coal-fired power. So if transition is inevitable, how do we prepare for it? Well, the foremost concern is obviously around um, mitigating the economic hardship that miners will experience, miners and their families and their communities will experience during the transition. If we don't mitigate these effects, and you, you tend to see that they persist through the generations, so it's not just a miner who loses its job, it's his son and it's his grandson. Um, and it's more than just the numbers as well. The kind of jobs that are lost is important. And mining traditionally, in, in Europe certainly, has been, um, it's been a secure um, source of employment, it's been a well-paid source of employment, and it's also been highly, highly regarded because economic, because our economic prosperity was really powered by coal. And first it was powered by miners. They were an integral part of the economic development story. Um, and replacing jobs like this obviously isn't easy. It's um, even with planning and forethought and preparation, these jobs don't just appear. But of course, it's not just about the economic impacts either. Um, it's also about the broader social impacts. And when the mine goes, the risk is that the community and social structures that were in place around that mine disintegrate and fall apart. And that's even more so the case when the mine is in a remote region and the, the strong, the healthy, the young leave the region and go and look for um, employment elsewhere and they leave behind the more vulnerable sections of society, the, um, Ill, the ill, the elderly, the less well-educated. And that can basically be the start of a downward spi spiral for these communities, which is compounded by fiscal pressures as the regions lose um, tax revenue but also have greater need for social, so social expenditure. So what to do? How do we prepare and put in place policies for these transitions? Well, the transitions that have taken place largely in Europe today can have some really useful lessons, both positive and negative. I'm going to talk about them in three main areas. And first, I'd like to talk about the design stage. Um, in many cases, the process of transition has been really um, politically difficult and confrontational. I mentioned the United Kingdom, but this has also been the case at various times in, in Poland and in Germany. And this is Spain in 2012, after the government announced they were going to cut subsidies to mining by, by a third. Um, so how, how you address this? Uh, there have been examples in the past as well, not just negative examples, but positive examples, where um, the reform process has been designed by by miners to get working together with governments, working together with coal companies, and it's been a much more of a dialogue and much more of a of a consensus bit driven process. And in these instances, the costs um, associated with transition have tended to be much lower. So there's this element around working together and bringing people together to build the um, to build the reform process. Second set of policies that I just want to briefly touch on is around preventing short-term economic hardship for miners. And um, there are lots of policy options and precedents here. Um, first of all, um, to smooth the transition, many countries use a policy of voluntary relocation where miners move from an operator, from a closing mine to an operating mine and then to the next operating mine. And while that's not a long-term solution, it can certainly help smooth the transition, especially for miners who are in the danger zone, who are like, between 35 and 45 years old. So when you do actually need to make redundancies or you need to cut jobs, um, typically um, older miners will be given early retirement packages, younger miners will be given redundancy packages to smooth the transition, and then in a lot of countries obviously there's a backup of the, um, of the state and in the social welfare system. But one thing that really comes out of previous experiences is that it's not really a question of whether these policies are appropriate. There seems to be pretty kind of um, widespread acceptance that it's good to give um, early retirement policies. It's more around um, the generosity of these policies. So um, in France, for example, the redundancy packages were extremely generous. Miners aged 35 and above basically retired on full salary for the rest of their lives. 
on <laughs> the one hand, this was great because there were no protests, unsurprisingly, when the mines closed down and um, miners were kind of happy to take these packages. On the other hand, um, a lot of commentators have correctly surmised that this was a very economically expensive policy, but also that it's had unintended side effects um, from the social side that it's led to um, problems like substance abuse, to dependency on um, benefits and to marital breakdown, domestic, um, domestic violence. So it's kind of striking this balance between, um, between what you need from your policy. Um, Another thing that is perhaps worth noting about these, um, these short-term mitigation measures is that they're only really successful if they're part of an integrated approach to securing jobs over the longer term. And that brings me to the third set of policy areas that I would like to discuss, and that's really around building resilient economies over the longer term. So if your mind is part of a diverse, vibrant, growing economy, then it's really a question of retraining your miners so that they can participate in that economy. Um, and about um, educating their children so that they can subsequently participate in that economy. If your mine is stuck in the middle of nowhere with nothing else around, then you've got a bit more of a difficult problem. Um, resettlement hasn't really been considered in European countries in, in, um, in, current year, in recent years. Um, Hongxia might talk about this a bit when she talks about China. Um, traditionally, what um, governments have tried to do is to focus on attracting inward investment into the area. And there are lots of examples here, and some of them are, have been really quite successful. Um, it was used in, in Wales, where um, the government managed to attract a, um, a significant amount of manufacturing and automobile um, building capacity. Um, it's been used in Germany, it's been used in, in Italy. But the trick with attracting inward investment is making sure that when when you um, stop giving companies incentives to come to the area, that they, s that they want to stay there. So it's about building your workforce skills over the longer term and preparing your economy for the, the next um, transition and not just basing your economy off low-cost labor. The other thing is really about making sure that um, the jobs that you're attracting are suitable for the people who don't have work. Um, So I guess there are lots of policies that I haven't discussed here. I haven't really talked around social and community cohesion, which is increasingly recognized as important. But um, what I would like to do now is to just give the floor to Hongxia to talk a bit about how China is preparing for the transition. And I'd, I just note that the transitions that I'm talking about are tiny right, compared to all the scale of what's happening in China and what's happening in the US and what's happening in India. But nevertheless, you can see that there have been benefits from planning. You can see that there have been costs for not planning. And when you look at the scale of what's happening in China and India, I think those benefits and costs can potentially be all the much greater. Um, so I don't. So um, I guess the message would be that the transition is happening. Um, prepare for it. Otherwise, it's going to cost a lot more than it needs to. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll have you and Hong Xiao correct me, but I think we've read that China has, they, they want to lay off 1.3 million coal workers by 2020, somewhere around there. That's who they want to lay off. Oh, where, um, oh, did you carry the clicker? Oh, go. It, you, you, the, you could look at it here. Okay. There it is. So. So you click that and speak in oh, the speaker. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, thanks, Jennifer, for having us here. Yeah. Happy Thank to have you. Thank you, for the great introduction. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story about Shanxi, but uh, it's a long story. I have very limited time. Just make it very yeah. short. But just make sure you speak in okay. the microphone. Okay. Okay, then we're good. Okay. Webcasting. <laughs> uh, Actually, Shanxi is located in northern China. Most significant uh, thing for Shanxi is its uh, uh, core resource. According to data, actually, this land covered uh, by almost uh, 240 billion tons of, of, of core resources, about four-fourths uh, uh, four of the total nation's uh, uh, reserves. Uh, uh, the, another thing is uh, things the mm, establish our uh, People's Republic of China. Uh, Shenxi has transported uh, almost 1.1 1 .1 billion tons of coal production across to almost 
provinces, locals, they are very proud about this. They also um, said, okay, um, Shenxi actually uh, has been always sacrificed their own land and the environment, actually lighting thousands of millions of households across the country. Uh, there is another thing I want to mention because not only coal dominated in Shenxi's e uh, economic structure, also uh, dominated in Shenxi's uh, social and cultural uh, systems because what uh, local people view the world and the coal transition also uh, affected by coal. Okay, uh, actually Shenxi's transition uh, happened a long time ago, by the end of 1990s. Shenxi uh, started to shut out a lot of uh, small, sky, uh, small uh, inefficient and out-document uh, coal miners. Uh, during the 10th five-year plan, also uh, 11th five-year plan, Shenxi was uh, focusing on, still focusing on the uh, closer the inefficient coal miners. But by, uh, during the 12th year plan, actually Shenxi has made a, a big move by reconstructing the coal industry, uh, which means uh, state-owned companies are, were authorized to uh, merge or consolidate small-scale coal mm, miners, including some private ones. Uh, after that, actually China, uh, not including Shenxi, the whole nation is in, uh, has been experiencing overcapacity issue, just the colleague uh, talked about that. To address the issue, actually back to February uh, 2016, the State Council issued the capacity policy. According to the, this policy, China is going to phase out 500 million tons of coal capacity, and also want to reduce and regroup another 500 million tons of coal production over the next five years. Following the national policy, the Shenxi government also make its own play. For example, they're going to uh, shut out, or, uh, um, they're going to reduce one million tons of coal co capacity, and also want to phase out all capacity less than 600,000 capacities each year. And uh, right now, actually, Shenxi government has started, uh, has stopped uh, to approve any new uh, capacity uh, at this moment. Uh, the capacity of coal actually happening right now. By 2016, according the national data, nationwide, China has phased out 280 million tons of coal capacity, which means the government has managed to arrange more than 500,000 laid of coal workers nationwide. Uh, for Shenxi, actually, Shenxi government has closed 25 coal miners. Uh, I need to back. Okay. Um, one significant thing is that the, among all those closures, there is a coal miner located in Datong regions. This mm -hmm. coal miner actually has been running almost uh, uh, 70, 80 years already. This closure actually affect 4,000 workers and more than 10,000 families in the coal mining regions. So to ensure the transition smoothly going on, the government uh, set up a 100 billion uh, industry transition fund uh, of which almost seven, uh, more than 70% flowing into the coal sector. By 2016, the uh, Shenxi government actually uh, worked very hard to assist more than 20,000 coal workers to making transition uh, using money coming from the government uh, support also raised by themselves. Uh, on average, in Shenxi, actually, each resettled uh, uh, employees actually received more than 15,000 yuan. Uh, layout workers actually have different ways to go. Uh, some uh, some of just uh, transferred to other positions within the same company, but uh, some of them just uh, uh, signed new positions out of the coal industry. Also, some people just uh, resign the current job and uh, 
uh, join the family business like restaurant, hotels, and also want to get a, a fresh new start. Uh, for those who haven't get a chance to get uh, uh, positions, uh, they could join some training workshops to gain new skills and uh, looking for opportunities. There are also early retirement policy issued by different companies to allow people to reti uh, retire. Uh, the bottom line is the government uh, will provide some public service jobs for those who have difficulties to find uh, positions. Uh, actually, it's been very, very hard for both the Shanxi government and the central government for arrange all those unemployment uh, workers. Uh, the over the next five years, for Shanxi only, they're going to arrange another 100,000 laid off workers. Uh, the most difficult is all those workers are in their 40s and 50s with very extensive experience in coal industries and also very limited school years and uh, just simple skills for coal mining industry. And uh, many people, they have been living in coal built cities for several generations. Emotionally, they just don't want to make change, don't want to leave the home. Some of still hold hope, for example, just thought, okay, probably we have dedicated to the coal industry for more than uh, decades, the government should take care of it. But um, others would think, okay, probably mm, the, uh, once more, the golden days of the coal industry would coming back. Uh, if we couldn't deal with all the social issues very appropriately, there would be potential social risks. Currently, there is very limited resources for arrange more workers because the economy in Shanxi is also melting down. Many companies are actually on very difficult financial situation, and uh, uh, fundings from government agencies are very limited. Some private coal companies actually they just don't have quality to receive central government support. Uh, there are also limited rooms for government or for com companies to create new positions at this moment. Uh, just as a colleague just told, uh, more and more layoff workers will be from uh, coal-fired uh, sectors or from other heavy, in uh, heavy industries. Actually, the Chinese central government uh, uh, has been supporting Shanxi uh, transition always. For example, before the Chinese New Year, primarily Li, paid a visit to coal miners in Shanxi. He told the workers, okay, the government, okay, uh, the government uh, uh, will try uh, our best to help all of you to resign new jobs in other sectors or some other positions. Uh, but one thing we should make sure, because the capacity in China is still going down, that's a must. And the uh, government will provide uh, financial support for all of you at least to ensure your basic lives. There are also many occasions, I think primarily, including all the top officials, they made it very clear. The uh, Chinese government is looking for some kind of balance which could keep uh, the capacity, economic development, and the employment issues at the same time. Uh, also, the important point the government made is that the structural uh, cha uh, uh, change actually needs to focus on new growth and development rather than some old industries. There are some potential solutions at this moment in Shanxi. Actually, there are some, uh, in Shanxi, there are a lot of uh, uh, ancient, uh, very uh, cultural heritage uh, villages around the coal mining regions. If government could use some of the industry transition fund and also encourage uh, companies to take their own responsibilities or provide some incentives to private sectors to invest in this uh, sector to combine uh, protection of the old heritage and uh, uh, coal mining regions, that would be some opportunities for uh, job transition. Uh, right now, actually, the Shanxi government has planned to invest 30 million yuan in the next three years to do environmental and ecological recovery and uh, soil re 
uh, remediation, uh, environmental protection is seen as a new growth for economy as well as job creation. Uh, right now, the Chinese government is running a solar leading program. Actually, Shenxi has been selected as a trail uh, for the uh, national program. Right now, there are uh, more than 100 pro uh, solar projects have been done in the summer coal mining regions and uh, for the purpose of poverty relief. Uh, back to 2015, I think, uh, the Chinese government initiated another project to uh, try to uh, combine poverty relief and uh, tourist development. Actually, Shanxi has 22 projects selected by the national project. Uh, finally, I just want to emphasize two things. Uh, for Shenxi or for China's cultural transition, there are important things we need to say about innovation and efficiency. That's key, because with the technology innovation, we'd, we would find ways to de develop new business and create new jobs for uh, those uh, affected people. Also, we need to think different ways, which means we need innovative ideas to try to turn the social and the environmental risks we are facing right now into business opportunities. Also need to mm, focus on efficiency issues, not only uh, not, not focus on resources, but also trying a way to put people in the right place for the company levels. If we could do efficiency, uh, uh, if we uh, focus on efficiency, probably could uh, uh, improve the quality of services or the also save a lot of cost for the company. Uh, for the governance system, there is also a need for innovation and uh, efficiency because during our uh, site visit and consultations, many people mentioned the Chinese government may need to think about just not putting a lot of money for arrange uh, layout workers, probably need to think to build up a very uh, advanced social security system to ensure all the uh, layout people have a basic life. Uh, there are also strong voice uh, 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 to suggest the government to set up a special fund, not f focus on uh, job recreation or, or arrangement, also focus on develop a new business and innovation and technology development or something. Also probably also need a uh, a strong vocational education system to enroll all those laid off workers to get new uh, skills for a fresh start. There are also important things for the way we are thinking right now. When we're talking about the coal industry, we need to think about out of coal. So uh, for Shanxi especially, need to, uh, to be opening up more and also need to uh, probably do some cooperation internationally and nationally to introduce some good business mm, models and uh, advanced technologies. Finally, I think also Shenxi need to follow the central government guard to speed up its state-owned enterprises uh, reform. Uh, finally, uh, on behalf of our research team, I would take this opportunity <laughs> to thank uh, British Embassy in Beijing and the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign of Affairs for supporting our work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do you notice when she was talking that a lot of the issues of the problems sounded kind of familiar that we've been hearing recently about our coal sector? Speaking of which, there she is. Let me change your slides. Why don't you tell them a little bit about your group over there? Absolutely, and thank you uh, for those presentations, and there are so many parallels. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you all. My name is Lisa Abbott, and I am a community organizer in Kentucky with a statewide social justice organization called Kentuckians for the Commonwealth. And we are statewide. We work on a really broad range of issues. 35 years ago, we got started in the mountains of eastern Kentucky um, really around two primary issues related to the impact of the extractive industry, of the coal industry. Um, in, in Eastern Kentucky, ownership of the land and ownership of the mineral was severed a century ago. 
and uh, turns out that there were no taxes being paid on the mineral wealth of the region that was owned by multinational corporations, but all the taxes funding our schools and our local governments were being paid by the surface owners. Um, and so that was the first issue that we took on. And then the Supreme Court in Kentucky also decided that uh, the mineral owners had the dominant rights, pr dominant property rights, so that when strip mining was developed in the 60s, 50s and 60s, but, but really took off in the 60s, uh, the courts ruled that uh, coal companies could strip mine your land without your permission and without having to compensate you. So those were two of the issues that um, gave birth to our organization 35 years ago. And uh, we have, over the years, worked extensively uh, with local community members on um, helping to address uh, uh, water quality issues and health issues and uh, damage to land, water, and people's and human health um, based on the, on the um, widespread um, mining in the area, and in the last 15 years, more and more, our membership has said we have got to, yes, we have to continue to work to mitigate the problems as much as possible, but we have got to be about solutions, um, and especially about helping to shape uh, what people think is possible and then what they help create to become possible um, in terms of a shaping a just transition um, for mine workers uh, being affected right now by very steep layoffs, but also for mining communities. I think it's important to recognize that um, in central Appalachia, certainly in the communities that, that I n know best, uh, the economy has never been good, even when the coal industry was booming, right? We, our counties are among the poorest in the nation, persistent p poverty um, for many people, especially for many women, but for many workers. Um, the, the economy has never been healthy, and, and the coal industry has provided really critical, long-term, stable, family-sustaining employment for some, but the, the general health of the, the broader economy has never been strong. And now those stable, uh, family-sustaining, really deeply meaningfully culturally and, and otherwise jobs are in rapid decline. Um, so let me talk just a little bit. I'm obviously not reading my paper. Oh, there's a Sure, thanks. Great, there we go. Great, so um, just a little context. Uh, that circle is actually around western Kentucky. It should be around uh, the eastern part of the state is the part, uh, the part that I know best. Um, and central Appalachia and eastern Kentucky is a, is a place with really rich assets, cultural assets, um, Natural, uh, natural resources, um, history, community leadership, really intense beauty, hardwood forests, obviously uh, uh, coal. Um, and the biggest sectors in the economy um, other than coal, uh, forestry plays a, a big role, but beyond that it really is the public sector, uh, healthcare uh, and, uh, and the school systems are among the largest employers, and then beyond that service work. So, as we are facing a really rapid shift in our coal economy, uh, there's, a, there's a, a real challenge in figuring out how to build on the assets that we have and develop um, employment in some of those other sectors. Coal has, um, uh, uh, this is, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit out of uh, order, but there, there is a very strong link between uh, the areas where coal mining has been in existence for 100 years in our communities and economic distress. Those red uh, counties in eastern Kentucky are the heart of our coal fields, so just making the point I was making a few minutes ago. Coal has played a huge force in shaping our region's economy, our landscape, uh, our politics, our culture, um, and for many, many people, and particularly for many elected officials in our region, um, the, the coal industry has really shaped our sense of identity and our sense of what's possible. And I can't tell you the number of times I've been in rooms with people where they say, without the coal industry, we are nothing. Without the coal industry, we have nothing, we are nothing. And so that is, it's a fundamental challenge as we try to re-envision for ourselves, what does the future hold? There's a deep level of, of fear and, and denial um, that somehow community organizations and public leaders uh, really have a role to play in helping to create an honest conversation that's necessary before any any of the planning that you were talking about, Lucy, can really take hold. Um, 
Kentucky is also a coal burning region, so this map just uh, indicates where the uh, power plants are in our state. So the eastern part of the state is uh, one of our coal fields, but fewer, uh, fewer uh, utilities are located there. And then the western part of the state, it, we're in that red area, we also m mine coal, and lots of our p power plants are located along the river there. So as America's energy transition goes forward, we are experiencing job losses and um, transition, both in the extractive side of the economy and in the burning. Kentucky has been 90, above 90 percent coal-fired power uh, for 70 years, and two years ago we dipped below 80 percent, and now it's 82 percent. So the, the transition is happening rapidly, uh, even in a place like Kentucky. Um, and this is a, a map of um, coal mining employment in eastern Kentucky. So, um, uh, pr uh, sorry, coal mining production. Uh, so for, for many years, uh, production stayed relatively stable. It bounced around, uh, but it stayed relatively stable, while uh, employment declined, has been declining since the 60s with explosives and mechanization. We experienced more loss of coal jobs under Ronald Reagan than we have in the last 10 years, but production remained relatively stable. And then now um, we are seeing really rapid declines in both production uh, and in, in employment. And eastern central, that's been true in central Appalachia uh, as a whole, and eastern Kentucky has been sort of the epicenter of job losses. Um, those, those trends, I can talk with anybody more uh, offline afterwards, but they're being driven for many, many reasons. Certainly the uh, uh, cheap cost of natural gas and the increasingly cheap cost of renewable energy. For us in eastern Kentucky, another real driver has been that as utilities, especially utilities in the south, installed pollution control scrubbers, which were required by the Clean Air Act, then they had decades where they were grandfathered in and they didn't have to, but they could meet their pollution requirements by burning our central Appalachian low sulfur coal which was more expensive than Wyoming coal and other Illinois Basin coal, uh, but it helped, it helped utilities meet their uh, pollution control requirements. And then once they installed the scrubbers, there's no more need to pay a premium for more expensive central Appalachian coal. So that's one of the, uh, one of the reasons why we've seen this really steep decline. Um, so our organization about 10 years ago started to talk with members, our own membership and people in our communities about this term that we call a just transition. We did not create the word, it really comes out of the labor movement and um, is often used to think about a just transition when there is a factory closure or a base closure. In our case, we've broadened the term um, because, because certainly the workers who are being affected by layoffs d deserve and need a plan for a just transition, but in our view, so does the entire community. And so we really need a just transition for the region, uh, not just for a specific slice of workers. Um, and so we think of a just transition as a process and a strategy to move towards economic, environmental, and social justice. That a just transition um, is a process. It's also a destination, right? Um, and it's, a, um, it's an idea that we have uh, really tried to promote a conversation in the region in a time of intense polarization and fear um, w we have found that it is possible to bring people together and say, what do we love about our communities? What are we scared of? But what do we think the possibilities are? And where do we want to go together? And that that's been quite fruitful. So we, over time, developed a set of just transition principles. I'm happy to share them with you. But it, it really is about improving the quality of life for people and communities, respecting the past while strengthening uh, communities and culture, promoting some of the things you were speaking about in, in the Chinese transition, promoting innovation uh, and self-reliance, generating good, meaningful jobs and, and access to them. And this point about inclusion, participation, and collaboration really seems uh, important to us. I'll skip that. So a couple things. I had an opportunity to um, travel to Australia in April to visit with some uh, folks in mining communities there who are experiencing their own version of transition. And they asked, it, we, we were being hosted by uh, some foundations, but also some community groups in, in affected communities. So they asked us to share a couple lessons learned. And, and the first thing I said is, well, we're in the thick of it, and we're not exactly doing it well. So um, I, don't, I don't offer these as, ta-da, we know the answers. Um, but here are some, some lessons that we are learning along the way. Uh, the first, this. Uh, this we learned from a, a 
cod fishermen in Newfoundland who we invited to come to Eastern Kentucky to talk about the transition that uh, happened in the fishing industry. And he stood in front of a group in Harlan County, Kentucky and said, in times of transition, process matters. It really matters. Meaning everyone has to have a seat at the table and in communities where there's often a local elite and then folks who are on the margins, we've got to create processes that give women a voice, that give young people a voice, that give people who are not uh, in, the, in the seats of power typically a voice in thinking together about where we want to go. And process has to involve affected workers as well as environmentalists and really come up with ways of bringing, bringing folks together. Um, Secondly, one of the things that we're learning is it's really um, a, a worthwhile challenge to, to think creatively about how do we change the conversation we're having about ourselves and our future. Um, I, that, that sense of without coal we are nothing, um, but also just the denial that existed in, in many of our communities about um, this is, you know, what, whatever is happening it's all the president's fault, and if we can just get the president out of the White House, then coal will come rushing back, right? There's so much um, that is not true in the public conversation that we're having, and so how to have an actual honest conversation about what's happening, what the trends are, what the driving factors are, and what it means for us, it's really challenging to, um, to get past the fear that people have and the, in many cases, the animosity and actually host an, an honest conversation. Let me check my time. Um, one of the lessons that uh, we are learning is that there is no silver bullet. Um, my, my husband works in uh, a similar field and he often says, we, there is no silver bullet, what we need are silver BBs, right? Silver and BBs. Um, <laughs> so there is, w uh, in, in Kentucky, our, our uh, story of uh, recruiting industry to the state that has been successful is a Toyota plant in the central part of the state. And so uh, there's always, uh, there are always folks who hold out hope that maybe we can just get Toyota to locate a plant in the middle of the mountains. Mm -hmm. It is very unlikely, right? And wh what is much more likely is that we will over time, slowly, thoughtfully, and with some deliberate planning, be able to develop more of a local agriculture system, more of a sustainable forestry system, a thriving healthcare industry, more arts and, and tourism, and that each of the more uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy development, each of those sectors um, is rooted in some of the assets of the region, but each of them also has very complex barriers, workforce development needs, investment needs, um, and so there, it gets as complicated as you wanna get going all the way down. How do you build a, a, a stronger local food system? is a very different conversation than how do you build uh, you know, a sustainable forestry industry, but those are the conversations that we need to be having and thinking about how do we grow our own uh, base rather than looking for, for help from the outside. Um, we talk a lot in our organization about the need to build new power and uh, thinking of that in, in sort of all of the dimensions of the word power. So. Uh, new economic power where um, there's not as much inequality and the wealth is more broadly shared, new uh, energy power in the form of energy efficiency and, and renewables, and new political power. Um, I, I can't speak for other coal communities, but uh, in the ones that I know best, the political system has been captured from top to bottom by the industry. And it is, uh, it, the result is, um, a stunting of the kinds of conversations and the kinds of um, policies that would really help our region grow into the, what we want to become. And so we really, we need to re reinvent um, power in all of its forms, including growing new, new leaders uh, from, from the bottom up. And um, so some of the things our organization has done, um, not alone, we, we work a lot with a lot of uh, different players in the region, um, but it's really been about uh, thinking about what are new models to um, put these forms of power in people's hands. So one of the, one of the most promising ideas uh, and, and projects that has been developed is an uh, approach to financing energy efficiency. So if you think about um, in many communities, in, in particular in rural uh, eastern Kentucky, we heat our homes with electricity. 
Our homes are uh, very, very inefficient. Many people live in mobile homes that are not well insulated, or they live in coal camp homes that were built in the 1920s without insulation. Um, in, for many people I know, the cost of heating their homes in the winter is more than the cost of their rent or their mortgage. It can be $600 a month, and for a family living on very limited means, um, that quickly becomes a source of real economic stress and insecurity. Um, but th those same families don't necessarily have the resources to weatherize their homes and put in in uh, insulation. So we've piloted a project with several uh, utilities where the utility pays the upfront cost of the home weatherization, and the investment is made, this is a little complicated, but bear with me, the investment is made in the meter of the home, not in the, not in the owner. And what that means is you don't have to have good credit. You, and, and it's not personal debt on you. It gets, you have the obligation to pay it back over time with a portion of what you're saving on your energy bill. But if you move, the obligation goes to the next occupant in that home. And so it is a way of financing energy efficiency retrofits that is affordable to folks that helps build their, the value of their home, the comfort of their home, reduce their bills, creates local jobs, um, and has obvious benefits for uh, climate and, and other pollution sources. So there are some of those kinds of models that we have been working with other partners in the region to try to develop. And it's those sorts of projects that I think are an example of what I mean when I say trying to build new, new power, right? Mm -hmm. um, clean energy power, but also putting economic power in people's hands in, in hopefully constructive ways. Um, and then one of the other things we've learned as an organization is just this idea of trying to be a catalyst for change not a container, that, that the, the task, the project of shaping a just transition uh, in central Appalachia or in China or in Australia or anywhere is so vast, um, it needs organizations and public leaders who are not about building their own empire or their own beautiful project, but really are about creating change through collaboration and through a lot of different, um, uh, helping to, to um, support good work, not just our good work, right? Um, and then the last thing I would say is that public policy really, really matters. Again, another, uh, to quote my husband again, he says, we, communities know a lot about what it takes to shape a just transition. It's just slow, hard, and expensive, right? And so um, to shape a just transition in central Appalachia, we're very clear it will take long-term public and private investments over time, sustained investments. And there are many different kinds of public policies that are um, needed to shape just the foundation of what we need to then be able to advance a just transition. So in my mind, the healthcare debate that we're having in this country right now is part of the just transition debate. Mm -hmm. That there's, there are very few places in this country that have benefited more from the Affordable Care Act than Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia where we've been experiencing the decline of coal. And I think it's very hard to think about um, how do we help support a just transition for miners and mining communities without also thinking about what are the social safety net, the kinds of things you were speaking about, about that, that basic um, assurance, that uh, life insurance, right? Um, and uh, how do we invest in our education system? How do we invest in the things that it takes to have healthy, thriving communities? And then layering on top of that, how do we support entrepreneurs? How do we support small business development in these key sectors? How do we, what are the supports that are needed and uh, required specifically for the affected workers themselves? So um, this uh, uh, set of infographics on the left, just to briefly mention, um, one of the things our, my organization has done over the last uh, two years is we decided to take on the task of writing our state energy plan um, that would either meet or exceed the clean power plan because we were one of the states where our political leader said, heck no, we won't go. Um, and so our grassroots organization said, well, I wonder if we could write an energy plan that would be better for jobs, better for ratepayers, better for health, and comply with the clean power plan. I just wonder as a thought experiment, is it possible for Kentucky to do that? And so you can read about it at empowerkentucky.org. Uh, we released it in April. And um, we came up with a set of strategies that include 
about $400 million over the next 15 years that would be invested directly in Just Transition Fund for workers and, oh, by the way, exceeds the Clean Power Plan and, oh, by the way, creates more jobs and is better for ratepayers than the business as usual course we're on. So public policy matters. We, there are choices we can make that could be good uh, for coal mining communities. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> lots of healthy, yeah, this, 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 this merged together nicely and lots of really inspiring insights. And um, I think maybe before I open it up, and one thing that um, just striking thinking about the US and a lot of similarities in term, terms of the challenges, but I think with Lisa, so much what you talked about was very kind of bottom-up solutions. But um, the other three in talking about, you know, I mean, Melanie, when you're talking about their coal reform, this was all top-down. It's government-led. And so just, I, I, I don't know, I, I was, where do I want to start? Um, so I was just kind of, kind of, well, I want, Hong Shai was kind of wondering if you and Lucy had anything in terms of like how in Kentucky, like what she was talking about what they did, is this a model? Is, does, does, does her organization, does this hold a, a useful model for China? This kind of how the, the just transition, this, because hers is a very bottom up model. Is it doable in Shanxi? Uh, actually, you need a microphone, sorry. Yeah. You can move it closer. Yeah, because I think uh, the political system between China and the US is totally different. As, uh, in Shanxi's tran transition, most often I think from top-down mm -hmm. approach, I think the central government as well as local government are applying right now. Uh, somehow, but right now, things a little bit change because uh, what I'm talking about, all folks on state-owned companies, mm -hmm. actually they are strong uh, in terms of uh, economic and uh, <laughs> power. Yeah, they have their voice, you know, all their channels, you know, to uh, Deliver the suggestions, recommendations, uh, recommendations, uh, recommendation. uh, recommendations. Recommendations. Yeah, <laughs> to the top. But mm -hmm. for the general, I think the regular co-workers or um, very general public probably they would need to expand more channels, mm -hmm. like Kentucky, to directly con have conversation with the decision makers. Some but it's not as easy. Not easy. Not as easy. <laughs> Melanie, you're smiling. So it's <laughs> very like your, yeah, your approach. There are some, you know, in mean, conversation and the justice, I think that's also we need. Well, and to be clear, I think one of the, I, I do believe that uh, the, the, the in the bottom up, obviously, and we've had such an absence of leadership from the public sector, from government, that that the need for leadership to come from grassroots organizations has been very strong. I, when I was in uh, uh, Australia recently, I met with a member of parliament who's elected by, uh, he says, by the Mine Workers Union. And he said, um, the Mine Workers Union last year adopted a policy for a planned phase out of coal, which is extraordinary, I think. And he said, so now I have to deliver. And the way I see it, I think I need three things. I need an honest conversation about what's going on in the industry, I need a source of revenue, and I need good strategies to deploy that revenue. And I thought, I, I cannot imagine a politician in Kentucky or in the US just being that matter of fact about here's, you know, there's a role for government in this, right? <laughs> so, um, so some of the reasons why it's so bottom up is we, we are missing a piece. Yeah. But that said, but like Melanie, when, when, you, when you were talking, I mean, what, what this top down approach, the actual success that it's had in transitioning the coal industry? Right? Um, yeah, so there's always difficulties on the margins. <laughs> so um, it, it's, in, it's interesting, it's been interesting to me to track um, the initial Chinese signaling coming down from, from Beijing out to the provinces that China's moving in a new direction. And then it kind of starts with general signals and then tighter and tighter regulations to push everyone along the same path. Um, but what really struck us in going out to, to meet with coal companies and going to the you know the underground uh, and on the coal plant floor was the way that um, plant operators and business operators had a very clear sense that they needed to do things. The things were changing. That the model of business success 
for five and 10 years down the road couldn't look like the model from 15 years ago. And so that's a big difference that I see between China and the US. It's my sense, I don't know the US coal industry well, um, like Lisa does, but my sense is that a lot of US coal companies are trying to cling to a, a kind of outdated business model that doesn't fit this country particularly with our, our great shale gas resources. Whereas the ones in China, because they're getting a mandate from the top, they recognize that the old business model isn't going to make money anymore and it won't even be allowed anymore. And so we were surprised at some of the, um, the investment and interest going on in China's biggest coal companies in green energy because they say they have to diversify to make money going forward. And that could work in China, but also, but there, there's been a growth. I mean, this whole, this, what happens from the bottom, when, sometimes in China, when we talk bottom up, we're talking about the provincial governments and the, and the sub-provincial governments. But the, the issue of, of these provinces not only investing in some of those, those quick and we, quick, we wanted to build those ultra super critical plants, but also the coal to chemical industry, you know, coal to gas, coal to liquids, because that's, because they, they're, they're doing that because they're concerned about jobs, right? right. So what's been interesting is um, uh, there's sort of a conversation happening between Beijing and the provinces that, that I see, where first, you know, Beijing says, okay, this isn't going to work for our, our, our future, our economy. We need to transition toward new energy sources. We're going to be reducing our use of coal. And the provinces say, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, what if <laughs> we have less coal-fired power plants, but we export the coal overseas through the Belt and Road Program? And that way we don't burn it, but we still get the revenue. You know, and Beijing says, well, that's not what we meant. You know, and so they have a back and forth. <laughs> and then another one that they tried is, what if, what if? you know, we, we turn coal into gas in Inner Mongolia and pipe it over pipelines to Beijing and, Sh and Shanghai so that they don't have to have coal plants in the east, but we can burn everything um, in the west. And we did visit a, mi a massive coal to gas facility. They told us that they turn a profit whenever oil is uh, $50 a barrel or above. Mm -hmm. They can they can do coal, it's coal to liquid, so they <laughs> compete with oil. We saw uh, coal to liquid filling stations in Inner mm -hmm. Mongolia, so people are driving up and fueling their cars with with liquefied coal. Um, so they are able to make a profit with the liquids trans transportation market. The coal to gas for power isn't working out very well. Technically, there are a lot of challenges. And there are also a lot of political pushback from Chinese citizens living in Western China saying, wait a minute, you're going to burn coal and foul my air so that the people in Beijing can live rich and clean. You know, that didn't go very well politically. So there's some uh, ter turmoil as the different provinces are trying to figure out what each one's coal transition looks like and what will coal look like going forward. And you know, we even visited plant uh, companies that are looking at turning using coal as a raw material to produce other things, not to burn it, but as a, a composite material. Yeah, well, I mean, because use it in the chemical industry. I've I've proposed ice cream because I thought that you know that we could do. It. <laughs> but um, but now last last thing. Oh, wait, did I lose my thought? Um, but but so as this experimentation is happening down below, and I'm coming to you, Lucy, too, because you you've looked at other countries. But in China, do you think that the central government is kind of looking and seeing how these different provinces are, you know, what's going to work in terms of the coal transition? Do you think they're looking for models that they might then mandate, or do you think they're going to continue to allow the experimentation that, that each province will find its coal transition way, as long as it's going down. Sure. So we've had some conversation with the central planners who are having to make some of these decisions and balance provincial interests. And so um, I, I remember right before the 13th five-year plan came out, we met with some of China's uh, central planners who were having to balance between the environmental ministry and the environmental interests, and Shanxi in particular, who was really excited about coal to gas as their alternative in a post-coal-fired power world in China. Um, and so they were doing a lot of detailed research studies to find out how much sense does coal to gas actually make in China going forward, what are the environmental damages, you know, what are the development alternatives. And so it looks like they're really just trying to balance all of their conflicting interests. So they are developing coal to gas plants. 
much less than was initially yeah. proposed. And they're looking- The water factors The there. water factors is factor. huge. And also just the, um, the the amount of money that it takes to construct a coal to gas plant and ship gas to the um, to the other, across the country when there are other alternatives such as newer alternative fuels yeah. and green power, clean power, which is a big jobs generator in China. They're trying to basically uh, balance all of the interests at the table and move China away from coal dependency in a, in a way that doesn't throw a bunch of workers onto the streets immediately, but rather be more of a gradual phase down. Last question, then I'm going to ask you guys, ready? Get your questions formulated. Um, for, so Lucy, with, with, with your work working with the Chinese government in doing the study in Shanxi, I mean, what's the next step? Are they interested in you? I mean, do they want to learn about this, this coal transition in other countries? Because you started off giving the example of Australia and Wales. I mean, is, are Australian, Wales, England kind of talking to their Chinese counterparts about this topic? I'm just um, Well, in terms of what, what's actually happening in terms of the future in Shanxi, I think Hongxi is perhaps a better place to answer that question than I am. Um, can I just kind of like come back yeah, yeah, please on do. Um, yeah, yeah. something that Melanie mentioned and about how coal companies play a role in the transition? Because actually we've seen that in certain cases, and I'm thinking particularly of the Netherlands, by kind of... Um, making sure that the coal company had an interest in the future of a, co of a country and future energy supply, then they were better able to bring the coal companies along with them. So um, in the Netherlands, it was a case that the coal company um, transitioned into the, the National Chemicals Company. And so the, the coal company and the management basically had an interest in making sure that, um, that the transition went well. Um, by contrast, in the UK, British Coal was actually one of the first investors in the North Sea, and it was the discovery of North Sea oil and gas which basically kind of began the transition away from coal in the UK. Um, British Coal was an investor in the North Sea oil and gas, and um, apparently um, um, it was kind of advised that British Coal um, was, didn't continue that investment. So um, it's interesting how you can the kind of like the dialogue that you need to set up and how you kind of position the future and you present the future as being something different from coal because I would kind of um, agree agree with Lisa that you know very often people can see that the that the future is different um, but they have their jobs to be worried about and they have their incomes to be worried about um, and so they kind of like they need a vision for the future and how they're going to participate in that future. Okay, I'm going to open up some questions and then we'll come back to you, Hongchik. Can I, um, questions from the audience? Hands high. Um, who, who has the microphone? And make sure, and just say briefly your name and let's keep the questions succinct because we got a lot of people with a question. Wait, is the mic on? I don't think it's on. On the very bottom, make sure the mic's on. The little switch and test it. Molly, is your mic on? Yep. Okay, there it is. There we got it. It's on. All right, give, give it to him now again. Oh, Jim Sang. Part of China's uh, economic boom has had to do with uh, migration from rural areas into cities. And one normally thinks of that in terms of farmers. Uh, how does that model work for miners? Since one of the questions with the American economy right now, in fact, is the loss of mobility. And China has had lots of mobility. Uh, any room for... We've got all these farmers migrating to the cities. How about the miners? Oh, okay, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm trying to answer your question. Actually, uh, when we're talking about all the uh, employment issues, just focus on uh, state-owned uh, companies. Uh, the numbers just show uh, registered uh, officially employ uh, employees. Actually, you are totally right. There are many immigrant workers from uh, rural areas coming to coal miners to work for a living. Uh, according to, mm, during the transition uh, period, actually uh, some state-owned company, uh, there are several different uh, employ, uh, employment uh, models, except for the official uh, staff. There are also short, uh, contractors, also from uh, uh, rural uh, regions like pharma and also have a very short contract uh, temporary workers for those two types of employees I don't think the company w would give any compensation for the living or the loss of job that's one thing another thing I think for the 
private company, uh, coal companies. According to uh, uh, the recent data, actually in Shanxi, we have almost 30% of coal miners belongs to private sector. Many, many, uh, I think, coal miners working in this sector coming from rural regions. As they are also facing some important issues because as I mentioned before, the coal facing out uh, uh, funding resources from the government agencies, actually they don't give to private sectors, which means even those coal miners you are going to be closed, there is no support for immigrant uh, coal workers. But they might just then just be, so just be okay, they become just the floaters. go home, yeah, or yeah. moving to other sectors or doing other jobs. Okay. Just but, are, there any coal, are there any coal miners that move to Shenzhen? Do coal miners move to Shenzhen? Um, uh, I don't have a specific data, but uh, yeah, if they move to Shenzhen, they're just out of uh, the coal industry, they probably just do some um, other service industry, working at restaurants and hotels and uh, uh, public service like, uh, um, um, how to? Or work in the factories. Working in factories yeah. or some, uh, yeah, making clothes, shoes. Is but, but generally, a lot of those migrants tend to be the younger 20-somethings, younger, right? Yeah. Not, not the 50-year-old like yeah, coal miner. Because before, uh, if you, uh, when the golden age, for the coal companies, if you were working at uh, were working at the coal companies, you would make a very good living, very good money. That's the reason many young yeah. workers they really want to work there. Okay. So, Alan? so we visited a coal mine in Inner Mongolia, and it was really fascinating to hear that the the workers in the mine are transitioning toward much higher educated workers. So, in the mine we visited, which is one of the largest mines in China, there's a, a big chunk of the workers are PhDs and master graduates, and another big chunk do have college degrees. And the percentage of workers in that mine that are that don't have a college education are shrinking rapidly because as the mines are becoming more mechanized and automated, they need an engineer. It's not it's not, not these guys. These guys. These guys. Yeah. It's engineers. And so we were driving through the tunnels of the mine and you don't see very many people. You know, you'll come across a guy on a computer and he's activating the drill, multiple drills that are going on in the mine. So it's much more of a high-skilled engineering job and much fewer of them than there were before. And so that means that, you know, the workers she's talking about, these contract, these uh, full-time staff workers, it's really like engineers, like in an ref uh, oil refinery in the United States, and much less, uh, more of the migrant ones are more likely to be the guy on the screen. So, but, and those guys actually have skills, which in theory could be transferable should their mine close. Yeah. I mean, See, the, the mine we visited had uh, multiple people working in it that got their PhDs and master's degrees in the United States. So once again, everything that we thought we knew about coal, wrong in China. <laughs> All right, let's gather, I'm going to gather three questions, so let's be succinct. Let's come up front here and gather these two. And Molly, do you have someone over by you here? To be fair, on this side of the room. Okay, so quick questions. and Say your name and affiliation real quick, too, yeah? I'm Henry Furlan. I'm with the US EPA. And I was struck by, Lisa, your comment about bringing the cod fishermen to talk to the miners. I'm wondering if there are some case studies of, of successful public policy interventions, because I think there's a sad lack of it right now in other industries like cod or, or auto workers in Detroit or steel workers in, in Pittsburgh, where they can see themselves in these models that, that may have worked in the past. OK. And pass the mic. I think the row in front, we had someone. There we go. So just remember the questions, everyone. We're going to gather. Yeah. Um, my name is Katie. I'm just a college student from Wesleyan University. <laughs> um, firstly, I'd just like to say how amazing it is to have four women panelists in the energy and policy sectors up here. Yeah, okay. Super Come inspired. on, people. Some applause here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, secondly, my question, I love the solution you described in which laid off coal workers transition to um, environmental recovery or green energy. There's something very poetic about that, and I think it makes sense. And I'm wondering why that hasn't been adopted in any large scale in the United States. And to anyone to answer this question, do you see that as a feasible solution? Are the economic barriers too high? Is it a partisan problem? Will it happen? Okay. And there's a third question. Mike over here. Where's... Oh, there it is. All right. Um, hi, my name is Josh. I'm a law clerk at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. Uh, this question is primarily directed for Ms. Abbott. Um, so you mentioned the just transition a lot. 
Uh, what are some of the efforts to implement uh, or to lobby the state legislature to implement some of those programs to take some of the grassroots initiatives you talked about and to put it in turn to public policy? Um, I'm from Massachusetts. I don't know much about the Kentucky politics, much about Kentucky politics. I'm pretty sure I thought it was the legislature was Democratic before. I could be mistaken, but I, could that lead to a, uh, a chance to implement some of your the initiatives you discussed? Great. Okay. I, I can, I can yep. try to maybe weave some of those yep. together. Um, in terms of concrete policy, sort of uh, w what are models, um, we, we have tried to learn as much as we can from, uh, and, and increasingly are looking internationally. I think um, there, are, there are a lot of lessons about the way that European countries have approached coal transition that you know, assume a, a role of government and, and a role for planning um, that, that we, can, don't, uh, we don't know very well or adopt very well, but I think there's a lot to learn. Um, we, we uh, the Empower Kentucky plan that I talked about, empowerkentucky.org, tries to lay out as many ideas as we could come up with for um, what we think would be, would, uh, be constructive in Kentucky. One, one model that we have in Kentucky is actually from Kentucky. We, we, were, we are a coal state, we are also a tobacco state. And in the 1990s, uh, when it was clear that the, uh, the subsidies and the ways that tobacco farmers had been uh, compensated were being phased out and smoking cessation was really important, um, there, there was a source of revenue, right? There was a master settlement with the tobacco firms, and Kentucky decided that it would spend that money helping to diversify our ag economy and created this beautiful model developed by not our organization, but other grassroots, the Community Farm Alliance and others, that, that involves local county-based structures that try to decide how that money gets invested in helping farmers diversify their, uh, their revenue and their business models. We have that in our backyard, and we don't, we don't look at it or, you know, we, so anyway, we try to lift that up, but, but there are models uh, that we can learn from. In terms of why remediation and clean energy jobs might not be happening to the scale that seems like they could be happening in, in coal regions, there is a bill in Congress called the Reclaim Act um, to accelerate the spending of, of a fund that exists right now that's called the Abandoned Mine Land Funds. When the, when the Federal Surface Mining Law was passed in 1977, there's a provision in it that essentially assesses a fee on every lump of coal that's mined. It goes into the Abandoned Mine Lands Fund, and it is supposed to be distributed back to um, uh, do remediation on pre-law mining, on, on strip mining that took place before there was a federal surface mining law, before reclamation was required. And um, little bits of that fund do get distributed annually, but $2.5 billion of it is unspent, um, in large part because the states that are mining the most coal and therefore contributing the most are Wyoming and the western states, and the states that have the most pre-law mining are in the east. Mm -hmm. And so the formula can't get agreed to, and so here we are. So um, <laughs> grassroots efforts from Kentucky and West Virginia and other states have helped in the last couple years get our Republican uh, Congressman Hal Rogers on board. He's filed the Reclaim Act, and it would accelerate the spending of about a billion of those dollars uh, for mine reclamation. So it just got its first vote a week or two ago uh, in its first committee in the House, and so it still has a long road to go. but. Uh, there is some, there's some movement there that could um, accelerate investments in reclamation jobs. Those are, those are jobs that uh, miners have, you know, have those skills, and it, it could put a lot of people to work for a short period of time, but gosh, that would be a good thing, right? Um, in terms of why more clean energy jobs aren't, um, aren't necessarily f helping to fill the gap, I just think, again, the, the politics of our state are captured by the industry. And so the, the clean energy policies that are, exist in Massachusetts are just wildly different than the barriers to distributed and, and other forms of clean energy in Kentucky. So we work at that all the time. Uh, it, at the legislative level, the Empower Kentucky plan that I was talking about, and now um, for a variety of political reasons, I, I think our work is increasingly cities and small towns and utility by utility by utility trying to make good things happen where we can because of the absence of leadership at the state and federal level right now on clean energy stuff. Okay, good. Let's gather another four questions. All right, on the very back row, is that, is that Ray? Okay. 
Hi, um, my name is Ray. I'm with the Kissinger Institute on China and the U.S. Uh, my question is um, a little bit comparative. Um, in China, labor unions are often like a subsection of like CCP entities at various levels, um, whereas in the U.S., uh, union membership in labor unions has been declining for several decades. So in light of um, challenges in um, collective like action uh, amongst different um, labor groups, which is seems to be what today's discussion really, really focused on, what are some of the strategies that uh, your organizations have found effective in um, advocating for um, effective transitions? Thank you. Okay. Another question about right there. Hi, my name is Claire Wong. I'm a student at Duke University, and my question is for Lisa again. Um, regarding your point about changing the conversation, it's such an important thing, but I'm just kind of wondering how to do that. So can you share any like ex stories or examples or strategies about what you've done um, to change the conversation? And also, if you have time for a comment on how to fight back um, industry domination of politics and state of Kentucky. <laughs> well. That's a short question. <laughs> Also talking up, up here, we got, how about by the wall? Did, did you ask before? Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Trey Taylor. My company is Verdant Power. It's a marine renewable energy company. Mm -hmm. We're involved in tidal power. So my question really goes to you, Lucy. I'm really impressed with the University of Cambridge's um, sustainable leadership rewiring the economy, 10 tasks in 10 years. And I apologize for being late, but did you bring that up as a process that might be implemented in China? for getting to the solutions of transitioning from coal to renewable energy? Hmm. And the reason I ask is this. Uh, we're in the process, I've been working in China for quite a bit, and we're in the process of working with CSEP in China, China Energy Conservation Environmental Protection. Mm -hmm. And it's with this idea that tidal power alone as an industry would create over 200,000 jobs in China. But we have to get business, finance, and government working together to make that happen. Okay, and then there was a some right there in the stripes. There you go. Hi, my name's Olive. I'm a student at GW. So, um, Ms. Hart, you mentioned that uh, the phasing out of, of uh, inefficient plants was happening very, very rapidly in China, but then also that um, because China was, uh, because of these large um, <coughs> regulations involved with efficiency of new plants, are those plants being phased out and replaced with renewables, or are they more being replaced with uh, clean coal plants? Thank you. Okay, okay, one more. Uh, Mel uh, Molly, do you wanna grab this one? Get your answers ready. Hi, I'm Pascal Bronder. I'm a student at Yale University, and I was wondering if there's any research in any country on how many repositioned coal miners retain their jobs long term. All right, go ahead. So um, who wants to start? Uh, we'll start at this end. Melanie. Sure. Um, so someone raised the question of worker bargaining power and unions in China versus other countries. You know, I think we should never, when looking at China, as Americans, it's easy to think the Chinese Communist Party has all the power, workers don't have power. One should never underestimate the power of Chinese workers. Um, I think it was in 2015, 2016, uh, the Chinese National People's Congress, the governor of Liaoning Province, at the big National People's Congress convening in Beijing stated on television that Liaoning province didn't have a problem with laid off coal workers and back pay to coal workers and coal, mi coal miners. And there were, I think the estimates vary between 20,000 to 100,000 workers went on mass protests through the streets of Liaoning and uh, created some political peril for the governor of that province. So Chinese workers do rise up 
in very striking ways when they feel that they are being wronged or um, that their livelihoods are um, at risk. And I've seen the Chinese Communist Party at very high levels respond to that. So there's a reason why they're really concerned about worker resettlement in China. You know, people might not vote, but they take to their feet in the streets when they think that things aren't being handled correctly. And the, the leaders in Beijing respond very quickly to that kind of uh, worker power. And in terms of what replaces the phase outs in China, it's a mix. Um, some older plants are being phased out and replaced with ultra supercritical plants. Some older plants are being phased out and not necessarily replaced uh, because China's energy consumption is is not growing as quickly as it used to be. Others are being re and inefficiency is rising. Others are being replaced by clean energy. It's really more of a rebalancing and restructuring of China's energy mix and the way that energy is used and uh, tra trans uh, transported around China on the grid as well. So who else? Uh, do I, shall we go to title? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. guess. Um, so <coughs> I, I guess um, in terms of tidal power, I guess for, for me this is another area where you see the need to bring together enabling structures from the top um, together with innovation from the bottom. Um, and you need a public policy for that, but you also need a kind of the ability for entrepreneurs and for um, small businesses to innovate. Um, I'm not aware of a particular project that, that you um, that you talked about, um, and I don't know about the appetite for tidal power in China. Um, I would just say that it's um, certainly the experience <coughs> in, in the United Kingdom has been that tidal power has been um, difficult to implement under kind of market conditions, and it really needs really needs support um, to make it wor worthwhile. Um, the question about um, statistics um, on workers that have been um, repositioned, there is quite a lot of data out there on kind of what the long-term effects of um, coal mine enclosure are, is. Um, kind of some of the data from the UK suggests that kind of deprivation or kind of economic job loss persists over generations. So um, the most recent data basically suggests that in the UK there are roughly 67 jobs for every working age adult. Um, in the former coal mining areas, that goes to an average of about 50 um, jobs per working age adult. And in some areas, the more remote, kind of relatively deprived areas, it goes down to 41, just 41 jobs per 100 working age adults. And um, this is kind of 30 years after the program of closures um, began. So, uh, yeah, there's that kind of data. It exists for other countries as well. Um, a lot of the German data is quite good. Okay, I think, was there any, did you want to add anything about the, I don't know, the yeah. labor union issue, or yeah, I, I just uh, I think you're totally right. Okay. Right, uh, right now, I think uh, 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 workers do have a s more, I think, um, uh, power. It, uh, you know, more opportunities opportunities to voice uh, their um, concerns, their wills. As uh, sometimes, you know, through the official channels, but the most often probably they have a, uh, the situation you are talking about in the Liaoning is different from Shanxi and from Neymeng because uh, Liaoning is uh, northwest uh, uh, China, that's the oldest uh, uh, industry base in China. Lot, lot of issues happening right now, not just the coal industry, you know, people uh, uh, go to the streets to protest, also from the uh, steel, and other sectors, it's just um, the uh, mass problem in that province. Right now, I think the Chinese government issued special policy to address issues in northeast uh, regions, especially how to revive the old industry bases using the innovation technologies and uh, uh, introduce n new business trying to solve the problems caused by uh, uh, laid offs and uh, other social uh, risks. I, I want to say more things about the uh, uh, coal fired uh, plant phase out. Actually, there are several different things you just mentioned. First, for efficient small scale uh, power plant, I think according to China, uh, Chinese government. Uh, policy need to face out completely. The second, if uh, uh, there is still young and uh, have, capa uh, have a capacity to 
uh, generate more uh, production, they would uh, necessary to introduce uh, some uh, equipment uh, facility to ret uh, retro retrofit it to improve the efficiency. The third one regarding the renewables. Right now, the Chinese government uh, uh, regarding renewable development, which actually the government are very cautious about that, that because there are a lot of uh, problems happening in uh, renewable producer regions in the in the Mongolia in Gansu and uh, in uh, Liaoning and other regions, the curtailment issues is the biggest challenge. The curtailment the, uh, issues, curtailment yeah. Issue right now, uh, according to the next five year plan uh, in energy and uh, renewable energy, the government focus is to resolve this problem first, how to make uh, the uh, uh, renewable connect with the grid. That's the first step and also improve the quality of renewable energy. The second thing probably is need to think balance renewables and the existing capacity of coal generations because of coal, uh, based on the economic development uh, uh, pace right now, actually China uh, uh, electricity overcapacity is existing uh, countrywide. Mm -hmm. Need to address this issue uh, right now in case you know some kind of risks happening or investment uh, failed because of uh, yeah. didn't, uh, you know, say the trend of the, the e electricity consumption in the future. And one of the risks is also, I put up one of the charts we did of numbers, I mean, the renewable jobs in the renewable energy sector in China are really growing fast. And so you want to, you know, they want to keep these kind of jobs healthy and growing. growing. So real quick, changing the conversation, do you have one quick antidote? Uh, sure, us? yeah. Uh, Two things we've done. One is we, this conference that we hosted in Harlan, Kentucky in 2013, which was sort of the um, the moment in time of steepest job losses. And we called it Appalachia's Bright Future, which was sort of a either a bold or a really stupid name for a, a conference at that moment. But it really was a, a three-day conference of sharing what we call transition stories. So that's where the cod fishermen and and others came together, and we had tobacco farmers from Kentucky, and then we had people telling their own transition stories um, from the region, but also looking a little further afield. And, and it helped um, take some of the polarization and the pressure out to, to talk about our stories, as opposed to, talk, to start the conversation about who's to blame and what should be done, but just what is our, what is our experience with transition, and everybody had a story to share. And it, was, it was very, uh, profound and has driven, propelled a lot of our work since then. Last year when we were putting together the Empower Kentucky plan, uh, the, if the state had been doing uh, clean power plan planning, it would have had to do meaningful public engagement. So we said, okay, we're trying to do the state's job, we'll do meaningful public engagement. What would that be? So we hosted community conversations in every congressional district in the state. We, we uh, served a local foods dinner because we thought who the hell would come to a conversation about the clean power plan unless we make it fun. We had a, a local theater group put together a 30 minute theater piece about Kentucky's energy issues. So we kind of <laughs> set the stage with a piece of theater. Again, um, we had a PowerPoint that an artist had, had drawn that was all sketches and again, people's faces and stories. So to the extent that we were sharing information out, we tried to make it very accessible and then the people in the room had an hour-long facilitated conversation at their table with eight other people about what's your vision for Kentucky's energy future, what do you think that will take, and how do we move in that direction without leaving anyone behind? Those were the questions. And before we got to those questions, we asked everyone to, sh to share their three-minute energy story. What's the story of your relationship to Kentucky's energy system? It was awkward, everybody giggles and laughs, but it turns out everybody has a relationship to our energy system. Mm -hmm. Asthma, black lung, a, a good job, a bad job, high bills. It was an opportunity for everyone to kind of enter the conversation. And then we took all of that data, and you can see it on the website, but tried to shape a plan that reflected the vision that we heard from people all over the state. The power of storytelling. That makes me really happy. Um, was it? Was there, was there another question here? Because we have a, we're gonna take, I'm going to take two more questions than you guys. Because actually, we have some surprise guests that, hang on for a moment. We've got to take two more questions, and then we'll have our surprise guest. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Joel Corrales from the University of Texas. Um, 
And uh, China's energy policy includes a strong desire to be seen as like a, a global leader on the energy transition to clean technology and renewables. Um, do you think that this has been successful in changing the nature of China's relationships with its regional neighbors uh, or its international status? Okay, one, another question? Okay, we got that question. Oh. I think that's you. Uh, so China's engaging internationally in two different ways. Uh, right now, China's overseas uh, energy footprint, where nations are already consuming high amounts of renewable energy, China's a big provider. Where developing nations haven't yet figured out how to do renewable energy or clean coal, China is providing coal. Sometimes the old plants that aren't operated in China anymore get put in a box and shipped to other countries and put back together. That's a problem. Drone delivery. Uh, no. Yeah. So, so, so we we want to. One thing that we're starting to work on at CAP is going overseas from country to country to see how China's energy influence is playing out in different nations. And I think as international, you know, analysts, we should do a better job at shining a clear light on both the good and the bad of what China is doing overseas. Um, in terms of the renewable energy field. You know, um, leaders in Beijing want China to dominate the trillions of dollars of clean energy component consumption that's going to be happening as the nearly 200 nations in the world with Paris climate targets begin to transition their economies toward cheaper, more efficient energy sources. I'm personally really concerned that under the Trump administration, um, you know, if there's some air being let out of the sales of U.S. renewable energy companies, we could wind up sitting on the sidelines while China runs a bunch of really great plays in clean energy markets. Um, you know, right now, China has great technologies. They're going to be exporting them. Uh, that's a good thing, but I sure hope we're on the field, too. Okay. So I said special. Um, I've, I found out um, last week that so, some of my friends here from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, China's energy group, were um, going to be in town. And I, had, I grabbed them, and it says, also more women, just so you know. We, we, we acknowledgement that there were power women up front here today, and we have a couple more power women. Um, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab's China energy group, they, they are actually uh, heading a new, uh, it's a new cooperation between U.S. and China on the water energy technology front. And um, that's an area that we, we've done a lot of work for a long time. And it's also part of the coal in China uses lots of water. And it's also one of the factors that is also, we didn't talk about it here today. We've had some meetings on it in the past that's pushing the, um, the coal transition. And if you, don't, if you guys will just take a moment, Jonan, you want to come up and just say a couple words about what Cirque Wet is? Yeah? OK, a little applause for another energy woman here. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as introduced by Jennifer, I'm uh, Nanjo and from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I'm the group leader for China Energy Group, which has been around for 30 years. And we're going to celebrate our 30th anniversary next year. Mm -hmm. I noticed the panel speaker, Hong Xia, is a yeah. good friend. <laughs> I didn't know she was here. And yeah, very nice to see you here. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so I will just quickly talk about this program we just started about a year ago. And this is a part of the US China Clean Energy Research Center. And it was initiated back in 2010 and uh, was by presidents from US and China. And they included uh, three um, big the consortia. One is on building, one is on clean re uh, the coal, and then the third one was uh, vehicle. And so that three programs has been running for five years and until last year, and it was very successful, and it was renewed for another five years. At the same time, and they launched the two more uh, and consortia, and one is on energy and the water nexus, and then the other one, I think, is on heavy duty vehicles. Mm -hmm. And so the particular one on, on the energy and the water nexus is we now call it Cirque Wet. Initially, it, it was put together by UC Berkeley, our lab, and then also a few other partners and many uh, other UC universities. We called it US, uh, U, the Cirque West. And it's mm -hmm. w water energy technology. Uh, I forgot what this S stands for, but WES. But I think the, our Department of Energy and wanted to be more national instead of just regional. So we now call it Cirque Wet. And so the under this program, 
Um, we are collaborating with the Chinese on five big topic uh, and uh, areas. The first one I think is the cooling um, and power for the uh, thermal power plants. And then the uh, second one is on, um, and they call it non-traditional water. So that's diesel, blackish wet or water, and a lot of this uh, maybe wastewater treatment. And the third one is on hydropower. And fourth one is a climate change impact on water system. And then the last one is using policy, the modeling and data analysis to inform policy making, more integrated assessment. And so for this five topic areas, um, and for on the US side, it's managed by uh, University of California, mainly Berkeley, but also collaborating with uh, UCLA, UC Davis, uh, UC Irvine, a number of the UC campuses and with us, and then also Stockholm Environment Institute is also our collaborator. And then we fortunately have Jennifer Wilson Center <laughs> also and, uh, um, and complementing our work under the circle. <laughs> Um, on the China side, and uh, Ministry of Science and Technology provides the funding. U.S. side was a DOE, um, but it's managed by two uh, institutions. One is, uh, I think, under um, their Bureau of uh, the Dep uh, Ministry for uh, Hydro Power, and um, then the other one is uh, under, I think, it's uh, part of the Sinopac, uh, their research institution. Um, so. And then they have different uh, institutions, universities working on the five topics, just as we do. And so we spend a year in trying to define, narrow down the scope, what exactly we mean by data analysis or model, and or the different technologies. So the particular area uh, we are involved in is a fifth area, is really um, the data analysis and modeling and scenarios and to inform policy making, which I think is also what the Wilson Center mm -hmm. uh, does. Do. Yeah, and then the rest of the work is more technology development, mm -hmm. hardware uh, technology and driven, and then some of the climate modeling. So for the fifth square area, we are trying to understand exactly what uh, uh, you talk about, really the nexus between water development goal and the energy development goal uh, in both countries. And as you know, and people were asking questions about the renewable energy development, China also has aggressive target developing other alternative energy. Besides renewable, there's how, the, how to better use coal, and like coal to liquids, coal to uh, gas, and coal to chemicals, and coal to X, all these different um, and technology they're trying to develop, and they have aggressive target for those because they now have some excessive coal and co overcapacity, and they're thinking of uh, how to better utilize those. And But when the energy and ministries develop their plan, they're not thinking about water. Really. Yeah, so there's a water implication of a lot of this development, as we all know, coal to X, and they requires extensive water. And the many of these plants are actually located in the area our panelists talk about, in Inner Mongolia and Shanxi, Gansu, where water is really scarce. And particularly in the summer, in Yellow River just dries out in the middle part. Um, so in the, in the future, it will create a lot of uh, dilemma and the challenges, because that's also where a lot of agriculture is based in. In ch for China, supplying uh, weeds and all these products to the entire country. So how do you balance the water demand from agriculture, municipal water supply, and the same time you're ag aggressively developing new energy, and so where do you put the priority? On? So those implications has not been sought out uh, and yet. Similarly, for the water development, as you know, China's developing their three uh, and uh, red line and mm -hmm. policy and all these mm -hmm. other policies. And so they have uh, the targets and also they have the water divergent project from south to north. And they're also developing diesel and uh, also the uh, gray blackish water and 
treatment. And so when the water ministries develop their plan, again, the, similarly, they don't think about energy implication. Actually, the energy used for the water diversion project is huge. It's reflected in the price, the cost. Last time we read, and by the time it reached the Tianjin area, the price of the water is already higher than diesel. <laughs> yeah, and so similarly for other word treatment and other plants they have, it, it will have the energy implication because diesel certainly needs a lot of electricity. So again, how do you balance that? And in the summer, do you produce electricity to run the diesel or do you use the energy to do other things or do you wa use water for the alternative energy supply? All these issues. and we're trying to use the modeling and the data analysis to help inform uh, the policymaker different angles and uh, how to co-control the water and the energy at the same time, but also there's other environmental implications, climate change, and it could be other agriculture, all these different uh, and uh, actually the uh, objectives the different government agency has and to inform them providing scientific methodologies so they can make okay. the decision so what this was you know like you go to the movie theater and there's a trailer at the beginning of the movie we gave you a trailer at the end of this meeting today because we are going to have the circ wet people coming out here hopefully later in the year but it just it, I, w I wanted to, you guys cause a lot of people in the network here don't know that you don't get to see you guys because you're out in california doing yeah. cool things out there. Right. But but the circ wet work, looking particularly at the cold water issue, it does relate to what we're talking about today because it's another one of the issues that's pushing the transition. And it's also just really nice to kind of wrap up our meeting thinking about this is an area where the US and China are cooperating. And there's more that we could, next time when you guys come out, mm -hmm. to also talk about the analysis is also looking at our own water coal transition in this country. So thank you for popping up okay, and saying thank hi. You. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Appreciate you letting me come and chat for a second. So I want to thank um, my speakers today for covering an amazingly large amount of ground and showing really fascinating to me parallels between the US and China on the coal transition sector. We're going to have more. I'm going to be bringing people out from Montana and West Virginia, so stay tuned on that, folks. And we're going to see if we also can get some interesting stories. I don't know if anyone's going to be as good a storyteller as you guys out in <laughs> Kentucky. Um, I also have to remember to thank the, uh, I should never forget to thank my funders, Climate Works, Energy Foundation, Luce Foundation, the EPA's Global Methane Initiative, and the US State Department is supporting our Choke Point Indie work, so we uh, give them a shout out. Thank you all of you for coming today. and. Speakers are here to be tackled gently at the end. So um, yeah, thank you again. Once more hand applause for my speakers. Thanks so much. I'm glad you made it. <laughs> right, this really did learn from you. Thank you. OK, thank you so much. Yeah. I, I loved your Hello. presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't read a lot of materials regarding China. Uh, US. Well, I'm the same way. Somebody asked me, what are the parallels? And I said, I'm really looking forward to learning. Yeah, that's the reason. Yeah, at some point, you want to have to come to the real talk. Thank you. Thank you.